Hello everyone, a very, very warm welcome to this event, starting at the source to save the ocean. My name is Yumiko Yasuda. I'm the Senior Network and Transboundary Water Cooperation Specialist at the Global Water Partnership. I'll be the moderator of today's session, along with my co-moderator, Sarantuya Dandaraya from UNESCO IHP. This session is co-convened by the partners of Action Platform for Source to Sea Management, including the UNESCO Intergovernmental and Hydrological Program, IHP, Global Water Partnership, Stockholm International Water Institute, UNDP, and the Secretariat of the Convention of Wetlands, the Ramsar Convention. Activities far from the coast can have profound impact on the health of the ocean. Threatened marine life interfere with the ocean's capacity to serve as a crucial carbon sink and reduce its benefits to the society. To protect the ocean from pollution and promote a sustainable blue economy, it is essential to take action on land and in rivers as well as in the ocean itself. Today's session will explore ways in which the freshwater and ocean communities can increase their collaboration to better understand monitor and reduce pollution across the source to sea continuum on land, coastal and marine ecosystems. We have a diverse range of panelists coming from Asia, Africa, North America and Europe, all of them working on a wide range of pollutions from source to sea. The first part of today's session starts with a brief topic introduction by all speakers, followed by interactive panel discussion where you will all be participating. Before we start, I would like to make some general uh, logistical announcement. Please note that today's session is recorded for those who are unable to participate. Please also kindly keep your microphone muted at all times. Um, we will be using a poll if as an interactive tool for you to, to ask any questions to the panelists. Yeah, please use a Zoom chat in case you encounter any technical problem. We will be also posting uh, any relevant links to the Zoom chat. We want to uh, meet you, so please do introduce yourself in the chat. Now, I'm very happy to introduce you to Ms. Marta Rojas Rego, the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, who will be now giving you an opening remark on behalf of all the co conveners. Martha was appointed as the Secretary General of the Convention in 2016. She has more than 25 years of experience working on conservation, sustainable development, gender and humanitarian relief from local to international levels. Prior to joining the Convention, she was a Deputy Secretary General and the Head of Advocacy at CARE, Head of Global Policy at IUCN and Executive Director of the National Parks Colombia. Ms. Marta Rojas Urego, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yamiko. I think I'm having some problems with my video. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, I'm having a problem with, the, with my video, so I'm going to make my remarks like this, and then I'll try to see whether I can disconnect and reconnect so that I don't uh, delay the, the discussion. So. Um, so thank you so much to the co-conveners for organizing this uh, very timely and important discussion as we need you know, to see and to take action on the urgency to save the oceans and to address the great challenges of climate change and biodiversity loss. And in, indeed, the next 10 years will be crucial for this. So the first point that I would like to emphasize, of course, is the important connection, the critical connection between freshwater and, and oceans. And here, the source to sea uh, concept is absolutely essential because what happens upstream in freshwater ecosystems happens in the oceans. And I'm very pleased to do these opening remarks. Uh, this connection is so central for the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, uh, given that the definition of wetlands covers both freshwater and marine and coastal ecosystems. So the status of wetlands has implications on the oceans. Uh, but they also provide nature-based solutions to many of the threats faced by oceans. And I would like to, to cite just a few. 
The first one, of course, is that water and nutrient and sediment flows affect the oceans. And here, the freshwater and marine and coastal ecosystems are very key in terms of regulating these flows and retaining sediments. The second point is, of course, pollution. As we know, 95% of the ocean pollution is fed by rivers, and this includes plastic. So it is absolutely crucial to integrate management from source to sea and the role of wetlands in terms of filtering, um, in terms of filtering these nutrients is, is, is very, very important. The third point is biodiversity. Uh, as you know, coastal and marine uh, ecosystems are very important for the biodiversity of the oceans. And just to give an example, 3,000 fish species uh, at some stage uh, of their life cycle live in these coastal and marine ecosystems. The fourth point is climate change. We know that the ocean is, is critical for climate change. And these uh, source to sea uh, wetland ecosystems are very important in terms of their efficiency in storing carbon and at the same time protecting against uh, extreme events. And finally, livelihoods. Uh, we know that, uh, for example, fisheries depend uh, absolutely in these uh, coastal and marine ecosystems. At the same time, uh, these uh, ecosystems are the most threatened today. We have 35% that have been, lost, have been lost since 1970. And the impact of the loss of these ecosystems has an impact on the oceans. So it is absolutely critical to ensure that we have healthy freshwater and marine and coastal ecosystems to ensure the, that we have healthy oceans. So I would like to finish with three key points and it's the importance of coordinating the implementation of SDG 6 and SDG 14. And here again, the source to sea concept is absolutely essential. The second one is how to use uh, these ecosystems as nature-based solutions to address the threats to the ocean. And the third one is to use existing instruments. And in this regard, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, for example, which has 172 contracting parties are focused on this connection and in protecting and using wisely these ecosystems. We also have the UN Decade on Ocean Science, which will be key in mobilizing the level of, level of ambition and action that we need to save our oceans for people and the planet. And of course, we have the partnerships that we have represented here, and I'm very much looking forward to this uh, interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha, for these opening remarks. And also uh, kindly reminding us that this uh, event is also co convened as part of the satellite event on the UN Ocean Decade, which I actually missed to mention in the beginning. Thank you so much, Martha, for this. Today's, in today's session, we would like to hear your views as much as possible and really want to make these sessions as interactive as possible. For this purpose, we will be using Paul Eve as a tool for you to provide input and feedback. So now I would like to um, get some uh, start this interactive part before we start the panel interventions. Uh, if uh, our tech host could please share the screen on the poll if while we've been waiting uh, for you to join, uh, you actually had uh, some of you have inputted where you're coming from. Now the first question here is how much is marine pollution coming from land? To answer to this question, please go to poleve.com slash GWP on your phone or on your browser, and then type in your answer. You can choose your response. Please let us know, is it 50%? Is it 80%? Is it 20%? How much percentage of marine pollution comes from the land. Tell us your opinion. Seems majority of you said answered 80% and some of you are saying 50%. Nobody's saying 20%, so obviously that's too little. Um, tell us your answers. Thank you, thank you very much. So the correct answer is actually, um, yes, 80%. So you can see a, a large part of the pollution that coming into the, uh, to, to the marine pollution is coming from land, which really gives an importance to this source to sea approach. 
in tackling the ocean, a clean ocean. So let's go to the next uh, question. We would like to know where you are coming from. We already heard, uh, saw that in the map, but we want to know which field of water management that you're working in. So we know our audience. Are you working on mainly on the freshwater resource management? Or are you working on mainly on the marine resource management? Or are you working on both freshwater and marine resource management or other sectors? Yes, please type in your answer through poleve.com slash GWP. Great to see a, a diverse audience here. I can see uh, freshwater resource management is almost 40%, followed by people who are working on the both. We have also great representative from the marine sector, 15%, uh, and then the others. And we're also great to see others are also interested in this topic. This is really great. Thank you so much. I think this really gives us a, a really colorful views of the diverse audience that we have. And I really hope that today's discussion and information will be interested to all of you. Okay, I have the third question for you now. In your view, what type of freshwater and marine pollution has the greatest impact on the ocean? You may choose multiple answers here, but tell us, what do you think has uh, the, the um, what, which type of freshwater and marine pollution has the greatest impact to the ocean? I see now the plastic and microplastics are the very popular choice from everyone, but also there's other pollutants um, and also important, nutrient pollution and toxic algae bloom. And of course, the plastic microplastic is now 50% of you said, yes, that's the, that has the greatest impact. Also the emerging pollutants and hazardous substances and ocean acidification. And um, yes, loss of oxygen, sorry about that. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, so actually, uh, I would like to know, uh, sorry, you can still keep the, the screen of the poly, please. I would like to um, just, for this, this question, there is no sort of say correct answer, uh, but I just like to invite uh, my co-moderator, uh, uh, Dr. Sarantuya Zandaraya from UNESCO IHP to just to comment, looking at the response from people. What do you think, Sarantuya? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear participants. It's a pleasure to co-organize and co-convene this session together with our Global Water Partnership. And this actually answer is very interesting to see. Of course, there is no one single right answer in terms of the extent and the persistence of uh, plastics in the ocean remaining for hundreds of years. Of course, this is the uh, greatest challenge, but of course, other types of pollutants are serious too, but they are more localized and we have lots of scientific knowledge about their impacts, while we also lack scientific uh, knowledge about the impact of plastics and the macroplastics on the marine life as well as on human health. So you have answered great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yumiko, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarantuya, for that comment. Uh, very insightful. Now I would like to go to the last question to all of you. Uh, the question is uh, coming now. Please submit your questions and don't forget to vote which one that interests you most. So here, this is where we can make this panel discussion interactive. We want you to type in the questions to the panelists. So we will keep this poll open throughout the panel discussion. So while you're listening to the panel's intervention, you can start typing in your question here. There are already some questions that we pre-submitted by some of the participants. And uh, so, so, so you have some starting point to look at. You can vote to the question that you are also interested. Somebody has put in the question that you're also interested in. 
you can upvote the question, then that comes more at the higher ranking. And then during the final discussion, we'll be taking some of the more interested questions by participants to be utilized and addressed to panelists. So yes, please keep your browsers open while you listen to that now the panel interventions. So now I would like to hand over to my co-moderator, Dr. Sarantuya Zandaraya, who I just briefly introduced to you. Uh, Dr. Sarantuya Zandaraya is a program specialist in Division of Water Sciences at the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, IHP, of UNESCO in Paris, France. She is in charge of IHP's activities on water quality and coordinates the International Initiative on Water Quality. She has a postdoctoral degree in Environment and Sustainable Development from the United Nations University in Tokyo and a doctoral degree in Environmental Engineering from the University La Sapienza in Rome. So Sarah and Tulia, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yumiko. Um, well, uh, ocean pollution has become one of the uh, greatest challenges the world community is facing. And for this uh, reason, the United Nations declared uh, a decade on ocean science for sustainable development to be held from 2021 uh, to, 2020, 30, uh, to 2030. So we started the ocean decade this year. The decade provides a, a common framework to ensure that the ocean science can fully support countries to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. It also provides a common framework that all stakeholders and sectors work together and take collaborative action. And for this purpose, we are organizing this uh, satellite event under the laboratory, a clean ocean of this uh, ocean science decade. So we really need to work together. We need to strengthen our collaboration between different stakeholders, in particular between the freshwater and ocean uh, science communities, because as our um, the welcome uh, speech by the um, uh, Ramsar Convention Secretary General has highlighted, the freshwater community has really important role to play in reducing uh, marine pollution. Um, the, uh, freshwater uh, ecosystems and oceans are uh, interlinked across uh, the large spatial area through water, pollutants, and sediment flows. Each year, we know that the billions of tons of different types of pollutants enter the ocean, which originate from the land-based activities and are transported through freshwater systems. So once transported to the ocean, many pollutants, especially those which are persistent, non-biodegradable ones, remain in, in the water, seawater and they accumulate in sediment seawater as well as in tissues of marine organisms. So the impact of the freshwater pollution extends beyond the basin boundaries leading to marine pollution and the degradation of marine ecosystems. It also threatens the health of the marine life um, uh, and has lasting negative impacts on marine ecosystems and organisms. So different types of pollutants resulting from land-based activities are discharged into the ocean via rivers and streams. So we uh, have here an, a panel of internationally renowned experts representing both freshwater and ocean science communities and also different stakeholders who will present freshwater and marine pollution in different regions, as well as we'll discuss action needed to address this pollution from both scientific and practical perspectives. So I have now the pleasure to introduce our first um, uh, panel speaker, Professor Hans Perl, who will um, present uh, the challenge of nutrient uh, pollution in the freshwater and marine ecosystems and how eutrophication harmful algal bloom dynamics um, take place along the freshwater and marine continuum. He will also give a global perspective of, of algal bloom proliferation in um, freshwater and coastal waters and how it impacts the ocean. So Professor Hans is uh, the Canaan Professor of Marine and Environmental Sciences at the University of North Carolina Institute of Marine Sciences. His collaborative research addresses microbially mediated nutrient cycling and primary production dynamics, 
environmental controls, management of harmful algal blooms and their toxins, and also assessing effects of um, human and climatic alterations of water quality and sustainability of inland and coastal marine waters. So he has published over 300 articles and book chapters on these issues. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Zarantuya. Uh, oh, great. You already have it up. I was wondering whether I needed to share my um, presentation, but it's there. And I appreciate being part of this. Uh, I am going to focus on the nutrient issues that we're facing along the what I call the freshwater to marine continuum. Uh, and of course, everything flows from freshwater into marine systems. And so what concerns we have uh, upstream ultimately uh, translate to impacts and management questions downstream. And on the left-hand side there, I showed you some satellite photos that show you chlorophyll, the algal uh, pigment uh, in different parts of the world. And you can see, of course, coastal regions are enriched with chlorophyll and in many cases uh, over enriched. And that gets to the right-hand side of my um, uh, covered slide showing you the blooms that we're experiencing in the freshwater and marine uh, interface. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So nutrient over enrichment has been recognized for a long time as being one of the key factors that's uh, leading to pollution and uh, trophic and biogeochemical changes in the coastal ocean and beyond. Uh, but I wanted to just go over some of the rules that have changed in terms of the nutrients that we are concerned about. If you were to read a textbook on nutrient pollution back in the 1960s or so, uh, you would be convinced that uh, everything in freshwater deals with phosphorus availability, uh, and in marine systems, it's nitrogen. In other words, phosphorus is the main control in freshwater systems, nitrogen in marine systems. But accelerating human activities has really changed this and has made a much more complex picture of it, uh, where we now have overloading of one nutrient that may be leading to the other nutrient becoming uh, limiting. And so as a result, these systems now reveal a complex picture and hence a real challenge to nutrient management. And the real bottom line here and take home message is that in many cases, both nitrogen and phosphorus reductions are gonna be needed to reduce eutrophication and harmful algal blooms. And that really is a big change from how we looked at this picture back in the 1960s when you know, we hadn't really overloaded many of these systems. And I'm just showing you an example from the Mississippi River Basin there, showing you the trends in nutrient loading that have occurred, particularly with nitrogen. And you can see how nitrogen has kept on increasing. Uh, and it's really now become probably the most important nutrient in terms of overall control uh, going into the marine environment. And this conceptual picture basically shows you kind of what I've been talking about, the inputs of nutrients uh, via various routes leading to accelerated uh, primary production, algal blooms. Those then are linked to uh, issues of uh, low oxygen when those blooms sink into the bottom waters. Uh, hypoxia, of course, is a, is, a, is a big factor, but also food web changes and toxicity associated with many of these blooms. Um, we just have a lot more nutrients out there in the coastal zone than we did 50 years ago. And so really managing them is, is taking a big change too. Uh, next slide. Oh, yes. And, and uh, of course, one factor that interacts very much with this nutrient loading issue is climate change, particularly more extreme storms, which deliver a lot more water, but also, of course, nutrients, and then droughts. And the, co the combination of those two uh, can often lead to harmful owl blooms because, you know, first you get a storm, you get the nutrients loaded into the system, and then if it's followed by a drought, the, the residence time of the receiving waters increases. And that gives an opportunity for uh, algal bloom organisms, particularly cyanobacteria, for example, to grow in place. So every aspect of climate change right now that we're aware of is really playing into the playbook, so to speak, of these harmful algal bloom uh, organisms that we see as a result of over nutri nutrient over enrichment. Uh, and the, and the bottom right-hand side is just examples globally 
of where we're really facing these problems and where they're accelerating. And you can see there's no continent that, uh, that ducks this issue. It's, pres it's really a global issue. Next slide. So what can we at present recommend in terms of nutrient management to really start uh, having some control on what's going on with eutrophication and these harmful algal blooms? And these are really take home messages. Um, many of them are not really quantitative, they're really qualitative, but I think they're important. One of them is that it's no longer just about phosphorus or nitrogen. In most cases, it's both nitrogen and phosphorus. So that really needs to be emphasized along the uh, freshwater to marine continuum. If we reduce one nutrient, it's likely to have an impact on the other nutrient. Uh, so really, the scales have increased tremendously. So both N and P are really important. The thresholds at which we um, see this eutrophication and harmful algal blooms are obviously system specific, but in the work that's been done uh, using bioassays and other ways of estimating uh, over enrichment, it looks like in many cases, at least the 30% reduction in these nutrients is gonna be targeted or should be targeted. And that should not be a big surprise, even though it's a big number, because if you look at historic increases in loads of those nutrients, they parallel that number or sometimes even exceed that number. So while that number is big, we should not be surprised about it. And really it needs to be a realistic target. Salinity is not necessarily a barrier to the expansion of harmful algal blooms. Uh, we thought, for example, that cyanobacteria only exist in freshwater. Well, guess what? That's not true anymore. The best example is the Baltic Sea, but there are many other places uh, and estuaries, for example, where cyano, uh, toxic cyanobacterial blooms are expanding globally. And many uh, individuals that are viewing this presentation probably know about a system in your uh, neck of the woods. We may need to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus more in a warmer, stormier world. As I've explained to you, uh, nutrient delivery is very much controlled by the uh, storm events and extreme storm events, but also blooms like it hot. Cyanobacteria, for example, their optimal growth temperature is often at 30 degrees or even higher. So warming also plays a really important role. And then lastly, the nutrient input restrictions that you know, I've put up there really need to be year round. We can't just think about phosphorus in the spring and nitrogen in the summer. Uh, these reductions uh, need to be year round because the residence time of the receiving waters is often very long, uh, greater than six months. So, you know, it needs to be a dual nutrient uh, input strategy on a year round basis. And lastly, warmer, longer growing seasons including earlier ice off in the higher latitudes and later ice on is extending the window of opportunity for these algal blooms to form. So no matter what aspect of climate change we're looking at right now, um, it looks like you know the, the harmful algal bloom taxa have really clued into that already. And they're taking advantage of the trends that we're seeing in terms of extreme climatic events. And I think I'll stop there and Appreciate the opportunity to uh, discuss this a little bit from the nutrient perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. Our next speaker is Professor Maria Antonio Tanchelo, who will present the um, challenge of plastics and macroplastics in this host context with a specific focus on Asia and uh, how to address this problem. Professor Maria Antonia Tanchulong is a professor at the Institute of Civil Engineering at the University of Philippines. Her research focuses on water, sanitation, solid waste management, plastics, and microplastic pollution. Maria, floor is yours. Hi, good evening from Manila, uh, Philippines. I'd like to talk about the plastics from source to sea. It has been reported that there is as much as 2.7 million tons of plastics that are leaked to oceans every year. And as we saw in our earlier quiz, that 80% of this are coming from lands. And from a study but, but released in 2021 by Meher, uh, they said that these plastics are coming from 
80% of these emissions are coming from just 10, uh, 1,000 rivers. And of this, the, the, the top polluting rivers are all coming from Asia and with seven of them coming from the Philippines. So, uh, most of them are in the national capital region where, where the capital is. So topping them is the Pasig River. So one serious impact of uh, having plastic pollution is the when, when they fragment, they become microplastics so because of the UV radiation and mechanical abrasion. So they fragment into very little pieces. Uh, it's, it's defined as those pieces that are less than five millimeters in length. And now they, are, they can easily be mistaken as food by our animals then they can be that they can get into our food chain then other microplastics would also be coming from our textiles the fabrics from our textiles also from our cosmetics then uh, next slide please why is this what are the factors that are leading to this to this plastic pollution there are several of them we can name uh, there's very poor waste management infrastructures, especially in our region. So collection rates are very poor. You have landfills that are ill-designed. Therefore, it's, it's very easy to leak out the, the wastes there. You have open disposal sites. And then recycling rates are very low for plastics in general. It's pegged at around 9%. And it's only for the rigid plastics. When we talk about the flexible plastics, the multi-layer plastics, it's almost negligible. And then untreated wastewater is a pathway of microplastics when, when you have the fibers and also the microbeads there. We can also see that there's an increasing consumption of plastics especially sachets and single-use packaging. This is quite common in the developing world where people don't have, cannot afford to buy in bulk. So everything is, you, you see all commodities which you can buy just for a single use. So thereby we, we use a lot of packaging. And then e-commerce is also uh, very popular, which uses a lot of plastic especially during the pandemic. So what are the solutions we can, uh, next slide please. So I want to wrap it up. That the last slide would show what are the, how to address these issues. We will address it both from the downstream side where we have to improve the waste management infrastructure, like improving the collection, involving the informal waste sector and building wastewater treatment plants so that we are able to trap microplastics. And then, of course, we have to address the upstream side such that we have to promote sustainable consumption and production. We have to hold uh, corporations responsible for their packaging through, let's say, an extended producer, producer responsibility scheme. And of course, we have to address uh, redesigning plastic packaging, how to close the loop. And finally, we need to improve data collection, management, and analysis so that we are able to identify where the points of plastic leakage is. And we have uh, interventions that are based on evidence and science. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, um, our next speaker is Dr. Yunis Obamba Jaswa, who will introduce the topic of emerging pollutants. We know that. Um, many new and emerging pollutants are entering our freshwater resources and ultimately find their way to the ocean. So Dr. Um, Eunice Bomba Jaswa is a research manager on water quality at the Water Research Commission in South Africa, where she manages a portfolio of projects that deal with the thematic issues of source water pollution and protection, including both microbial and chemical uh, emerging contaminants water-related human health and wash activities. Eunice, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sarantia. Um, good 
Afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon right now in South Africa, um, 3.35 to be exact. Um, I just want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk a little bit on emerging contaminants or emerging pollutants, chemicals of emerging concern. I mean, there are lots of variations in the name, but yeah, it's a wide topic and um, we've been given three minutes <laughs> to break it down and I'll, I'll try to do my best. But basically, um, just to set the scene in terms of what emerging contaminants are and what we're talking about. They are synthetic or naturally occurring substances that are not commonly monitored in our environment. And specifically, we don't know whether they cause adverse um, human health effects or effects to um, our ecosystem as well. And I think that is where the complication arises. Some um, contaminants we've been using forever, but then because obviously of increased use, um, now we might be seeing some kind of um, adverse effects due to the increase in um, occurrence and use. So if you look at the two diagrams, I've just provided um, a picture representation of origins of our emerging pollutants and routes to the environment. And basically it's really through our wastewater treatment works. If you are con, uh, connected to a sewer system, if you are not, as is the case in some of our developing countries, people dispose of their um, chemicals, whatever it is they're taking, their um, drugs, um, their personal care products directly into either um, river systems or into unmanned landfills. So obviously you are able to also get contamination into our river systems through that kind of process. But wastewater treatment works, even if they are functional, they are not necessarily designed to remove all our contaminants. Then the other diagram I, I thought was very nice because it really describes um, in terms of where we have our outfalls, our storm outfalls, which are really um, important when it comes to the marine contamination that we're talking about right now. And obviously you also have a lot of municipal treatment plants, septic tanks as well is something that we might not talk about a lot, but then we have the groundwater influence there as well. Sludge is another huge issue. Um, in South Africa, we use sludge a lot. So um, contaminants that are actually concentrated in sludge then end up running off as well into our aquatic environments. Storm outfalls is a big one in South Africa. Um, next slide, please. Can't see it on my, oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. So as I was saying, storm outfalls is a big one in South Africa because we do have a massive coastline. We have a coastline of about 3000 kilometers and we have been doing marine um, sewage outfalls for a while. Um, in Durban, for instance, one of our um, coastal cities, there has been a marine sewage outfall program that has been running for about 40 years. So you can imagine now the change in contaminants that they are measuring from when it first started to now. So I just wanted to provide two examples of um, really nice publications that have come out recently on some of the work that has been done on emerging contaminants. The first one um, reviews literature that has occurred for the last 20 years. And I think that is very apt right now for South Africa because Thankfully, we have put in a lot of funding um, that, what do you call it, that um, promotes research in CEC. So even if you are, um, are a research body, you are able to come up with data. If you are a, an institution that um, deals with um, toxic substances, whether it's um, liquid um, waste or um, solid waste management as well, and you're collecting data on CECs, you're also able to, to do that. So um, the first paper, Touched, touched on groundwater, surface water, um, wastewater as well, and mapped basically contaminants within South Africa. We found about 32 contaminants and contaminants were in all provinces. The second paper then is a marine paper. So it basically shows us where some of the contaminants end up. So the example that I chose is a nice example around PFAS because PFAS right now is something that we're talking about all the time, endocrine disrupting compounds as well. And they found a lot of these compounds in fish samples in um, the Western Cape area. So I think those two articles kind of give the indication that in South Africa, we are looking at that source to see issue when it comes to contaminants. And thankfully last year to our Minister of Forestry and Fisheries actually launched a source to see program, making sure that we are having that linkage between our, what's happening in our freshwater and what is happening as a result in our marine environment. Environment. Next slide, please.
Okay, so finally, I just want to kind of give some tips around um, risk-based management of emerging contaminants that South Africa has been looking at. I think most importantly is probably identifying some kind of priority list. Um, obviously, development of analytical techniques is key for both um, toxicity studies in humans and ecosystem. One health surveillance is also something that we have been exploring a lot, especially around wastewater-based epidemiology. And then thinking about all the research that's going on around emerging contaminants, you know, bringing that together in terms of knowledge hubs, you know, much like how we have the NOMA network um, in Europe, South Africa is also doing that right now. End of pipe measures are also really critical. So if you know what your contaminants are, then you can now start setting values of discharge, for instance. Then upstream management of chemicals is really key during the whole life cycle of, um, of chemicals in terms of management. South Africa um, recently said, um, actually that you couldn't, you're not allowed to now have liquid chemical waste in landfills. And that was such a big um, deal and a movement in terms of contaminant management. And then finally, um, advancing water treatment technologies and for our part of the world, decentralized wastewater systems is also a good um, way to go. And if you need more information on this work, the Water Research Commission has a lot of reports and repositories on our website. So please do feel free to check that out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eunice. So these three uh, experts have introduced the topics uh, of um, different pollutants uh, for following discussions, but now we also have two very um, eminent uh, panel speakers who are representing international and regional collaborative mechanisms. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ruth Matthews. I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthews, who is a senior manager at the Inter Stockholm International Water Institute and provides uh, deep knowledge on uh, uh, impacts of human activities on river and coastal and marine ecosystems to projects that uh, reduce uh, those impacts through improved governance and bottom-up uh, up engagement. As a coordinator of the Action Platform for Source to Sea Management, she also provides strategic leadership to the multi stakeholder initiative to achieve this aim. So Ruth will uh, focus on the importance of the source to sea management and how upstream and downstream stakeholders can collaborate and cooperate. Thank you, Ruth. The floor is yours. yours. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's really great to have these three different perspectives of the ways that activities upstream are having a, a consequence on the ocean. And, and this is fundamentally what we're talking about with source to sea management, that land, freshwater, coasts, and marine uh, environments are connected and linked across. Uh, that continuum. And so there really isn't a way to address them in independent uh, approaches. And this is one of the key messages that we want to bring out uh, through this event and in our interaction with the decade of ocean science is that um, there is definitely need for more science to be done uh, on the marine environment itself, but we cannot forget the impact that is coming from upstream activities on the ocean. And understanding those linkages and those connections is critical to the success of the decade and also the ability for us to reach SDG 14 on the ocean. And so what we are trying to do here is to bring forward that we need to, and you can go to the next slide here, um, that, that we need to, uh, to, to work together, essentially. We need to break down the silos that have uh, been keeping us uh, in very topic specific uh, approaches to science, to governance, to management. Um, looking at one particular sector, looking at one particular segment of the source to sea system. And so only thinking about freshwater, only thinking about how land is being used, agriculture, food, energy, uh, coastal zone management, marine protected areas. Each one of these has been addressed uh, in, uh, in isolation and in its own little compartment. And we are not going to be successful in achieving the 2030 agenda. We are not going to be successful in achieving the Paris Agreement and keeping 
keeping 1.5 alive um, if we do not break down these silos and work across uh, the, the sectors. And my call to the to the ocean decade, to the scientists, to all of us together, is to, um, is to really build the case for actions that need to be taken upstream to reduce those nutrients that are coming down, that nitrogen and phosphorus, reduce those emerging pollutants that are coming into the fresh water and out into the coasts and the ocean, um, to reduce plastics and, and microplastics flowing through the source to sea system. Um, we need to uh, really make the case that those actions are benefiting not just the ocean, but the benefits that the ocean brings to us are also coming back upstream and providing benefits to all of us so that it is not a call for altruistic action. You do this, you put in a wastewater treatment plant so that the ocean is healthy. It's that you put in a wastewater treatment plant so you can get those benefits for climate change, for blue economy, for, uh, you know, for all the ways that a healthy ocean contributes to our overall well being. And so this is what we mean by the source to sea approach, source to sea management is this upstream downstream cooperation and coordinating across sectors. And I call to all of you to join us in doing just that. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you uh, for highlighting the importance of science. Well, uh, we know that we really need to focus on the science and for example, on the plastic um, research over 90% of the research focuses on microplastics in the marine environment and while uh, the freshwater microplastics research is a new area. So this actually leads uh, very nicely to the next um, topic. Um, I'm, uh, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rudiger uh, Strempel, who uh, has been the executive secretary of the Helcom Convention on the Protection of the Baltic Sea since August 2019. He is an international lawyer by training. He looks back on many years of experience in environmental law, policy, and diplomacy at the national and international levels with a particular focus on international marine ecosystems. He has been previously the executive secretary of the agreement on the uh, conservation of small citizens in the of the Baltic, Northeast Atlantic, Irish and North Seas, and also of the Common Widen Sea Secretariat. He also has worked for a number of years uh, in other UN agencies. Moreover, Rudger has a background as a journalist and a professional communicator, and he is the author of uh, many articles and several books. So, um, uh, Rujagar, you are the right person to talk about the role of intergovernmental and international and regional organizations to protect transboundary marine ecosystems such as the Baltic Sea, and also connecting to the previous um, uh, speaker's uh, focus on science, how science can inform intergovernmental decisions such as the HELCOM ministerial decisions. We know that HELCOM uh, convention is one of the exemplary organizations which works collaboratively and also takes into account the scientific findings. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Saran Turiya, for this kind introduction. And thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here today. And um, well, having listened to all my previous speakers, I can tell you that my presentation now is going to reflect and also corroborate what they said. Um, and I'd like to begin by giving you an idea because I'm sure not everybody will be entirely familiar with the Baltic Sea of, of what the situation in the Baltic Sea is. So um, to understand our situation, you have to know that the Baltic Sea has a catchment area, which is four times the size of the sea itself. Um, and therefore it's evident that land sea interactions and linkages between the freshwater and marine ecosystems are not an academic issue for us in the Baltic Sea region. This is a region that hosts about 85 million people and it's very busy and economically vibrant with a lot of larger cities, countless businesses and industries and significant agricultural activity as well as um, uh, sea-based activity as well. 
And even though this is one of the most heavily navigated sea areas in the world and there are substantial sea-based activities, it's in fact the catchment area that is currently the biggest source of human pressures affecting the Baltic Sea and its marine environment. To add to our woes, the Baltic Sea is a semi-enclosed sea and it takes about 30 years for a full water exchange to take place, which means that whatever enters the Baltic Sea here today, for instance, outside my office um, in the harbor in Helsinki, will still be there um, in 2051, which is something that we, we sometimes are not aware of, theoretically, of course, but to give you an idea of the time frame for lo we're looking at. And the Baltic Sea region comprises seven larger rivers and count the smaller ones that feed the sea with their waters and whatever else they may be carrying. And that, of course, includes nutrients, pollutants, litter, and so on. And so, not surprisingly, the main issue currently affecting the Baltic Sea is the excessive input of nutrients from agriculture that leads to eutrophication and algal blooms, fueling the growth of the, the now infamous Baltic Sea dead zones, which are anoxic and also a lot of hypoxic zones. So eutrophication is the single largest pressure on the Baltic Sea and um, an incredible 97% of the Baltic Sea is affected. Besides the algae and, and the disturbance uh, to biodiversity all this entails, eutrophication also leads to concrete economic losses of up to 4 billion euros per year, so that's quite a sum. But there are, of course, also other matters of concern, such as pollution by hazardous substances, including persistent organic pollutants, pharmaceuticals, and microplastics. And um, I'd like to particularly highlight the latter today, because recent assessments have shown that microplastics were found across the entire ecosystem, and even as far away as in Arctic pristine lakes, which therefore clearly are not quite as pristine as we'd hoped for. And although they are not at all part of the sea itself, this shows the scope and dimension of the problem. Again, the origin of a problem can be found on land and main sources uh, include laundry and the washing of garments made of synthetic fibers, larger plastic items such as plastic bottles and other containers that break down into smaller pieces, tire and road wear, cosmetics, and interestingly, cigarette butts. So if any of you are looking for an additional incentive to, to stop smoking, this might just be it. Now, from our perspective, for a healthy Baltic Sea in a good ecological state, which is what Helcom is uh, established to achieve, we literally need to look further upstream. We need to consider the entire catchment area and identify the pathways of nutrients and pollutants to the sea to address the problems at their source and not at the level of the sea or not only at the level of the sea, because in most cases, that would be far too late. For instance, it's much easier and potentially less costly to prevent microplastics from entering the water system in the first place than to remove them from the sea. Now, only a few weeks ago at this year's uh, Helcom Baltic, uh, uh, at this year's Helcom Ministerial Meeting, we updated our most ambitious action plan, the Baltic Sea Action Plan, or BSAP, which contains roughly 200 concrete actions and measures for a healthy Baltic Sea. Many of these address land-based pressures, such as, for instance, inputs of nutrients and hazardous substances, agriculture, wastewater, pharmaceuticals, and chemicals of emerging concern, such as certain POPs and some of the issues addressed by the or, uh, some of the issues addressed by the plan. The BSAP is to be implemented by 2030 at the latest. But now, remember, and of course, I don't have to remind anyone in this audience, we're talking about water here. And water knows no boundaries. And this is true for sea areas as much uh, as in many cases for rivers. Because if we have transboundary rivers or border rivers, we have several countries involved. And only if these countries cooperate can we actually effectively address the issues we're facing. And so for the Baltic Sea, this is where Helcom comes in because 10 contracting parties, and that means all Baltic Sea countries and the EU are joining forces to protect the Baltic Sea. And as you, you know, as the saying goes, if you want to go far, go alone. Um, if, hang on, no, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, anyway, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that is um, what we're doing. And this is where Helcom comes in. Um, because of course, it's not just Helcom alone. The Baltic Sea area is covered by a broad range of frameworks and institutions and legal instruments ranging from the global to the regional to the national levels which address the issues we're facing. And of course, um, one of these is also um, the EU, which uh, is very important for us because for on one hand, the EU is a member, is a contracting party to Helcom. And for those of, its contract, of Helcom's contracting parties that are also EU member states, the EU is, um, has uh, decided that Helcom should be an implementation platform 
for its legislation. And a lot of the relevant legislation dealing with the issues we're talking about here in this region is of course EU legislation. So that is one side of it, but of course we're also closely collaborating with global and regional frameworks such as uh, the UN and um, other regional frameworks. And one thing um, I would like to highlight is that this is important because global frameworks um, may be too global and more regional frameworks may not cover the entire region. And we in Helcom can translate the global visions and goals to the sea basin level and we can offer a highly targeted regional response to the issues at hand. And one way, for instance, that I'd like to highlight in which we're doing this, and here we come back to the source to sea continuum, is that we're actively promoting and engaging in cooperation between sea and freshwater communities, for instance, through our joint workshops and joint activities with Helcom, between Helcom and river basin management authorities on the nutrient input issue. And finally, besides co the cooperation, another ingredient for success is having access to the best available science. Now, we pride ourselves at Helcom in the fact that our work is science-based. We don't take random decisions. What we do is science-based, and we have a uh, rather comprehensive apparatus to ensure that this is the case. The structure of, of Helcom is such that science is fed into the decisions of Helcom. And so um, in that regard, and others, the Baltic Sea is a front runner because not only because uh, Helcom's uh, work is generally underpinned by solid scientific knowledge uh, and knowledge about the natural and human processes taking place, but because we follow a bottom-up and science-based approach with issues usually first considered by expert groups before being escalated further up for consideration by policymakers who often have a scientific background. And um, uh, we are lucky, we're blessed, I would say, to have a very vibrant, a very lively, a very active scientific and research community in our region. And in addition to being able to draw from a pool of experts for Helcom, we've also been closely collaborating with science funding institutions such as Bonus to gain access to or sometimes even place an order for the necessary scientific knowledge needed for achieving our ecological goals. So um, one final thing I'd, I'd like to um, mention is that to improve our science base, uh, we have recently also launched and again adopted at uh, last month's ministerial meeting our Helcom Science Agenda, which highlights our predicted science needs for the next decade. And with this agenda, we hope to guide researchers to focus on the areas where we still have the greatest knowledge gaps. Thank so you. in a nutshell, and to conclude, the Baltic Sea's ecosystem extends far beyond the sea area itself. And because the entire region benefits from the valuable ecosystem service the Baltic Sea provides, we therefore have an interest in maintaining it in a healthy state and cooperating to do this. And uh, this is what we're working to do. Thank you very much. And sorry if I was a bit too long. Thank you so much for the excellent introduction of the uh, regional uh, role of regional pro uh, organizations and the science. And we, as UNESCO, we were very happy to collaborate with Helcom, and we were happy to see that uh, recommendations of our work also were taken on board by the Helcom Ministerial Declaration. So now I hand over to my co um, chair, co moderator Yumiko, for the interactive uh, discussion. Yumiko, floor is yours. Back to you. Thank you very much, Sarantuya, and thank you all the speakers for very rich and interesting uh, interventions. Now let's look at the poll, Eve. There are many questions there coming in. Uh, the most popular question is, what methods and measures have been developed to trace the source to source of land-based pollution and what other technologies can be used for? Um, I would like to address this question to both Hans and Eunice with your uh, background uh, in this uh, in this area. And then I have next question. Actually, if you also would like to uh, touch upon this uh, further down question, say what are the example of most effective mitigation measures to reduce both nitrogen and phosphorus in the environment? Also, please feel free to answer that question. Um, then I'm going to ask the next question. What are your recommendations and suggestions to today's audience? on what source to see action they can take. I would like to ask Rutka to answer this question, perhaps along with the question, uh, the fifth question on how the source to see approach contribute to implementation of certain SDGs. Um, and then the third quest, popular question, what kind of science is further needed to reduce pollution in the ocean, particularly coming from the river basins? I will ask this question to Maria. And then finally, I would like to ask the booth the uh, fourth question. How does this blue economy and ocean economy together with the approach hold great potential to enhance freshwater and ocean health? 
So with that, I would like to perhaps ask to start from Han and then followed by Eunice. On the first question, what methods measured have been developed to trace the source of land, land-based pollution and what other technologies can be useful? Hans, please. Yes, thank you for the questions. Actually, the question that deals with, um, this question is really tied in with the question that deals with what can we do to mitigate, you know, to mitigate uh, nutrients as well. So really the, the um, as, far as, as far as tracing, um, you know, the, there, are, there have been a variety of things that have been used, including stable isotope uh, tracing, uh, using uh, fluorescence indicators of specific uh, nutrient compounds, particularly nitrogen compounds. And then the good old method of doing this, and really I think probably mostly preferred, is to simply have good monitoring and, and have the ability to identify the key sources at the source uh, using total nitrogen, total phosphorus kinds of measurements. In most cases, those are gonna be the most effective ways to trace uh, the major sources of nutrients. There are lots of problems with uh, uh, the isotope techniques because uh, you know, one source, the, the, the different sources have different isotopic signatures. So they all get mixed together. And ultimately in the end, you have to measure the sources anyway in order to deal with a, a mixed model to predict these uh, inputs. So there is nothing better, I think, at this point globally to use to then to have really good monitoring at major sources and to develop ways of assessing total nitrogen, total phosphorus inputs. That's the start. Now, uh, mitigating these nutrients, uh, you know, we only had three slides. If I had had four, I would have put that slide in there. But anyway, I, <laughs> I uh, okay, so what are the major sources? You know, in most cases, they are point sources like wastewater or industrial uh, effluent inputs. And then we have this big slice of the pie in most places, non-point source inputs, which are diffuse inputs coming from either agriculture or even urban areas where you have stormwater runoff and things like that. The, the best overall solutions right now is to intercept these nutrients before they get into uh, streams that ultimately get into rivers and down estuaries. And there are some really good, good uh, non-rocket science, I would say, at techniques to use, including riparian buffers, uh, putting strips of native vegetation around agricultural fields uh, and even urban development areas so that you can use the native vegetation to intercept uh, nutrients before they get into these uh, sensitive waterways. There are a lot of good technologies now on riparian buffers and developing them. And we've been successful in North Carolina, actually, in some of the river, uh, river uh, watersheds with these uh, you know, riparian zones. Now, you know, that means that um, farmers will have to give up maybe a little strip of land around what they're growing or urban areas will need to dedicate some uh, parts of their, their development to this. But, you know, if we can subsidize farmers not to grow crops in the US, we can certainly subsidize them to put some of their land into these protective vegetative zones. And I think that this is a really number one um, good approach to dealing with mitigating nutrients. Other approaches include uh, uh, certainly uh, saving, but also developing uh, wetlands. Uh, in, and, you know, there are many good uh, ecological and, and uh, engineering strategies right now to use wetlands to intercept nutrients so that the nutrients can be converted into wetlands. For example, denitrification, a very good way to get rid of nitrogen if you have a wetland that can denitrify in a major stream system. Uh, good septic systems. You know, there's still a lot of the world that is septic, that's not hooked into uh, wastewater treatment plants. And having septic systems that actually work as opposed to just having them look good, but not really function properly. Um, and then from the agricultural side, uh, applying fertilizers and still chemical fertilizers are still the number one source of uh, nutrients in, may, in, most, in many watersheds. So that you know, we formulate fertilizers so that they can fertilize what we need to grow, 
but not over fertilize and have slow release kinds of fertilizers, for example, as opposed to chemical fertilizers that can be washed away in one storm event. So these are all, these three are all pretty low tech kinds of approaches that can be um, encouraged in many watersheds. And they've been shown to, act, to actually reduce nutrient inputs. For example, riparian buffers can reduce nutrient inputs by 50% in many agricultural watersheds. And I'll just stop there because I've taken too much time, I think. But um, that, those are really the key uh, kind of low tech approaches, but they're not really low tech in terms of their effectiveness. They are very effective in many places. The one problem that we have, of course, with climate change is that we're getting more extreme events. So, you know, we have to really be prepared for that as well, uh, where a system can get overwhelmed uh, by a major storm or hurricane or typhoon or cyclone, depending on where you are in the world, um, that, that we have no current management strategy for, except and uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could wrap up, would be great. Yeah, anyway, um, you know, applying fertilizers sparingly is certainly a, uh, uh, another approach that can be very effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Uh, now we turn to Eunice, and I would like to kindly ask our speaker to give a brief answer, maybe one, two minutes, please, Eunice. Sure, I'll do that. I think I just want to, I mean, apart from the things that Hans said, because obviously some of that are related to emerging contaminants as well, especially if you look at your um, point source, um, and then obviously diffuse as well. Those um, mitigation measures are the same, but I really want to just emphasize what he talked about, about monitoring. So I think in South Africa, that's where we're going to. We're looking at monitoring protocols for freshwater using the local context and local land use activities that are happening. And then from that, we can prioritize hotspots and then have interventions that are relevant. And I think in that also is probably the use of citizen science. I think for emerging contaminants, we are seeing that citizen science is something that could be um, beneficial as well. And if you have data, obviously, then nice models are available. The Bayesian model you can use, but those are very data intensive, so they might not be a, a solution for everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, Eunice, for that uh, intervention. Uh, yeah. Now we're talking a lot also about different techniques and science. I would perhaps ask Maria, uh, what kind of science is further needed to reduce pollution in the ocean, particularly coming from the river basins? Maria, what are your thoughts? Yeah, yes. So the science that is needed from the, from the solutions that I was trying to present, like how to address these issues, uh, such as if we, I'm talking about the waste management sector. If we look at the entire value uh, chain, all of those uh, elements have, have uh, issues to address, but specifically we need to have systems which is applicable to smaller systems, to, to smaller populations, to remote areas, and that are scalable when, when we're talking about technologies. Uh, because now the technologies that we have are, are really for large scale, but we have to think of ways which are applicable for, for smaller scale. And in particular, uh, because there's still the challenge of recycling film plastic or the multi-layer plastics. Those are the problematic plastics. And also, if we look at the upstream, we need to have to find alternatives for this kind of uh, plastics, like what's, what are the alternatives to single use plastics? It doesn't have to be necessarily this in terms of material, but maybe other systems, like how can we help people to buy in bulk or to have refilling stations, uh, those, those kinds of things. But I'd like to add uh, in terms of the study areas that haven't been that are still unknown. For example, we still don't know the risks that plastics pose to human health or to organisms. I think we need to deepen the, the knowledge there. And especially because I was reminded by the presentations of the previous speakers of uh, Hans and Unis, that there is interaction. Like plastics actually worsen the transport. It hastens the transport of the toxic compounds because it is 
it, it can attach to the to the plastics and yeah there's they're also found in algae so we have to study those mechanisms yeah that's it thank you thank you thank you thank you very much maria for these insights now i would like to turn to ruth uh, about this question, how does the blue economy or ocean economy together with source approach hold a greater potential to enhance freshwater and ocean health? Ruth, please, your thoughts. Yeah, it, it, thank you for this. And, and part of where I'm going to come from in my responses, I was just recently at COP26 uh, in Glasgow in the climate talks. And uh, one of the things that really rose up very strongly uh, in the discussions uh, themselves and, and in, the, in the activities that surround the negotiations is um, the incredible value of nature-based solutions, the incredible value that comes um, in terms of climate mitigation, so climate capture, uh, I mean carbon capture, uh, and climate adaptation. Um, that comes from, is it wetlands, is it forests, is it coastal mangrove areas, is it sea grasses and uh, large mammals in the ocean, all of these elements of a source to sea system contribute a huge amount of value to us. And so when we think about the blue economy, first of all, we don't want to just think about um, what comes from the ocean and extraction from the ocean. So how many fish can we take uh, from, from fisheries? Uh, how can we uh, have energy sources from the ocean? Um, but to really think about the ocean in relationship to the entire source to sea system and, and ultimately the, the whole planet, um, and how it contributes to our overall well-being. And, the, and as I said earlier, to be able to achieve the SDGs, to be able to achieve the Paris Agreement, we really need that healthy ocean. And, and so what I see is that source to sea ties us in, brings us from just thinking from an ocean perspective um, to thinking in a holistic way, thinking system-wide. So when we are investing in nature-based solutions, um, like for instance, restoring and protecting wetlands, uh, that we are doing that with the thought in mind of how do we uh, build a, a healthier source to sea system so that it benefits all of us across um, from land to freshwater to coasts and the marine environment and ultimately creates an opportunity as, for us to get the full value that we uh, can from, from the ocean. Um, so that's what I mean by the blue economy arising from the ocean, but in combination with the entire source to sea system so that we have uh, a holistic and system-wide approach to finding those benefits. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth, for this, uh, this reflection. Very, very interesting. Uh, finally, I would like to hear from Ludga um, if you could answer the second most popular question here. What are, the, what are your recommendations and suggestions to today's audience in what the source C action they can take? Uh, you could perhaps combine this with the other question of how source to sea approach can contribute to implementation of certain SDGs. You've already mentioned some ideas in your, uh, in your talk, but if you could elaborate on that, it would be really nice. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Yumiko. Um, so I took too long earlier. I, was, uh, I talked for too long, so I'll try and be very brief now. So my, my first and initial plea to everybody is, in fact, to take action. That is, of course, the important thing we need to do, and we need to take action now. This requires us to identify the issues and the causes that we're, we're dealing with and the sources where this is still needed, and then to work to address these causes upstream. As I mentioned earlier, that is really essential. Um, of course, we have to address um, the issues um, at the uh, marine level as well, but we should try and address them upstream. And the second element of my answer is that in doing so, what we need to do is overcome silos. 
Um, and there are so many silos, and Ruth mentioned this earlier in her presentation as well, there are so many silos that we can basically um, hide in or entrench ourselves in. We need to overcome those. And that means, for one thing, we have to work across national borders because as we're talking about water, as I said earlier, we can't go it alone. We need to work with those who share those waters with us. Um, then um, we need to cooperate between freshwater and the marine communities. Um, only these two communities together can actually address uh, and alleviate these problems. We need to involve the multitude of stakeholders involved in all this. And let me just mention maybe three uh, or four groups. Of course, we have agriculture, undoubtedly. We have the wastewater treatment sector, and we have a number of industries that contribute to these issues on the one hand. And on the other hand, we also have civil society, which needs to be involved, and the scientific community, of course, because all of this needs to be based on the best available and most up-to-date um, science and technology. So all of this needs to be brought together, which is um, no small feat, but is absolutely essential for achieving our aims. And well, the source to sea approach can contribute to the implementation of, of a number of SDGs. And of course, um, SDG 14 comes to mind, but there are also many other SDGs involved um, because we as societies, we as humankind depend on healthy seas for our survival. And so uh, this of course um, touches not only on the seas as such, it uh, touches on biodiversity, it touches on the climate change related uh, issues, it touches on societal issues. So. If we address this and thereby contribute to making our seas, our oceans healthy, then we contribute to achieving the uh, SDGs as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rutka, for this intervention. Now, uh, I think we have heard a really diverse um, situations and the views from the speakers. I think repeatedly we heard the importance of um, taking action, the importance of also the nature-based approach and really not necessarily have to be a grand system, a small system can also really much help to really take action. Um, importance of science, more monitoring. I think that we heard this, this over and over and uh, also as Ruth Garza rightly said, and um, overcoming the silos. Uh, we really need to work across sectors, across, across the geographic scope, across from source to sea. So on that note, I would like to thank all the panelists for a, a wonderful uh, interventions. We really all learned a lot. Thank you so much. Now I would like to turn to our participants to tell us what you have learned. So just one final reflection from what you have heard. We would like to hear from you. Just, just listening to what uh, speakers have said in today's session, what do you think, what action do you think that you can now take to reduce the pollution from source to sea? Please type in your answer into this poll if. We'd love to hear from you to see how today's session was um, interesting for you and also has inspired your thoughts in terms of what you can do. Just, just reflecting on what the speakers have said and what you have learned in the discussion, what action do you think you can take to reduce the pollution for, from source to sea? Thank you very much. I see the answer. Collective effort is needed for source to sea success. Very true. We just, we just heard it. We, we really need to, to work with across sectors, across, across the uh, landscape, learn and inform others. Yes. Please share the, the spread the words of what you have heard today. We as humankind depend on healthy seas to the service. Great reflections by Rutger. Thank you so much. This is really true. Our, our life all dependent on the healthy ocean, healthy ecosystem. Our ocean is very important. Yes. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a really a large space and we just tend to think everything's going to dilute in there, but no, I think we really now is the time for us to all take care of it. We're all dependent on ocean. People really understood the importance of ocean. We need to tackle this issue at the source in a collaborative way. Thank you so much. Um, very interesting to involve citizen science to monitor pollution. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you so much for that. Yes. We all have a role to play at the different levels and citizen science can play a big role. 
everything is connected in nature. Yes, we have learned this uh, importance of the nature-based approach. And yes, again, coming to this continuum from the source to sea. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, really great to hear this reflection. And also we are really encouraged as a source to see our platform partners to see how today's session has inspired all of you. So now with that, I would like to conclude the panel discussion session and hand over to my co-moderator, co Saran Tuya, for concluding, concluding session. Saran Tuya, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, we had a very um, interesting, active, uh, interactive discussion. And now it's my pleasure to uh, invite our co-convener, uh, Dr. Yerker Temlander, who is the Director of Science and Policy, the Secretary of the Ramsar Convention, to summarize the discussions and also to um, give us some inspiring messages in terms of what can be done as next steps in the context of the source to sea management of freshwater and marine pollution. We have already uh, created the first bridge between the freshwater and ocean scientific community, so we can even start now taking action. Jürgen, uh, floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sarandria. Thanks for uh, putting a heavy burden on me and also to panelists for making it increasingly well, both easy and difficult, easy in the sense that you have conveyed a lot of very, very valuable information, uh, difficult to, uh, to add to that and uh, uh, make it not sound like I'm stating the obvious. I, I do think we heard some fantastic examples of the role of science in helping us understand system dynamics. And, and this is really important. Uh, the implications of multiple pressures on ecosystems uh, emerging issues, the connections between these ecosystems. Uh, we heard much about wetlands as the connectors of land and sea and what happens in them or to them uh, has great consequences for the coast and for the ocean. So this is really the first sort of main message that I uh, would like to emphasize here and that is effective ocean protection or management for sustainable development is dependent on science much beyond ocean space itself. Uh, it's dependent on that because it needs to capture key processes that influence it. And indeed, it's also important to remember that the processes and systems that influence the ocean are also highly dependent on the ocean, for example, as a climate regulator. So this is one key element here. Um, we also heard very clear examples of the deep interlinkages between environmental, social and economic systems. And the implications of that is, uh, is that much of our management or protection of the environment, including the ocean environment, of course, entails governance interventions in the social and economic realms, We're managing people, managing behaviors, processes. Uh, we do that through laws, through regulation, incentives, whatever else. Uh, examples that crept into the discussion here include, for example, uh, voluntary or mandatory nutrient use efficiency targets in agriculture or incentivizing redesign of the plastic value chain or regulating use of certain compounds, et cetera, et cetera. And crucially, all of that needs to be based on an understanding of how the environment works and how it is affected by those things, those human actions. So second message I think I wanted to convey here is that Again, effective ocean protection or management for sustainable development needs transdisciplinary science. It needs this collaboration across scientific fields, across communities, uh, across uh, countries, and so on. Um, then we heard some very concrete examples, including from Helcom here, on, on, on their structured approach to science under the auspices of an intergovernmental process, uh, transboundary issues that require transboundary solutions. Um, as an example, under the Convention of Wetlands, where I obviously work, uh, we also have a subsidiary body uh, tasked with providing scientific and technical advice to parties based on which they can take action nationally to meet their obligations under the Convention, as well as internationally through decisions of the Conference of Parties and in other fora. Um, 
Of course, these and many other processes like it uh, uh, leave us with quite a lot of important lessons learned. And um, this includes, uh, you know, being confronted with the complexities of sectoral and jurisdictional boundaries and their implications for pursuing integrated response pathways. And I think we have this recognition formally within these intergovernmental fora of the need to pursue integrated solutions and integrated actions. Scientifically, I do feel we're quite aware of this, and I think presentations today reflected that, but many systems in place don't yet reflect that because of how they have evolved. And again, this is perhaps my third message, is that there are many formal science to policy mechanisms at different scales. They exist, they function, they may be imperfect, but these are the uptake pathways for science, for science to have an input in sustainable development. So it's really crucial to build on them. It's crucial to be conscious of them, about their mandates, uh, and how to best leverage them, leverage them in order to then complement them where it's required. So there are three sort of major messages I think came out of the discussion. Now, one or two more things if I still have the time. Uh, first of all, this event is organized as a contribution to the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. And I wanted to take the opportunity to remind everyone that there are actually three concurrent UN decades. Ocean science, there's a UN Decade for Ecosystem, re ecosystem Restoration, and there's a Decade on Water Action. So they have come about in different ways. They each provide distinct opportunities to accelerate delivery against global goals, whether SDGs or uh, climate change goals of the Paris Agreement or the soon-to-be global biodiversity framework. We all have an opportunity to further elaborate and exploit the linkages that exist between them. For example, what science is needed for ecosystem restoration that safeguards the ocean and its contribution to sustainable development. And that can also deliver water security. So again here, wetlands are a crucial part in this context. Um, somebody spoke about the SDG goals and so on. And I think wetlands are immediately relevant to over 70 of the individual SDG indicators. And Hans gave, I think, some concrete wetlands examples that address this point. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to echo here very much is the point made by Rudiker, which is just take action. There is plenty to act on. There's much scope to act. So lastly, and to conclude, I, I want to acknowledge partners in convening this event. Each has a different role, a different mandate, whether partnerships, UN agencies, a global convention. Um, some of you who are listening in, who are participating, may already be directly involved in our work. Um, Many of you may find the action platform for source to sea management a, a, a very useful entry point. It's hosted by CWI and effectively provides a community of practice uh, with more than 30 partners working together to break down the silos that we have talked about a bit here today and, and move towards a holistic source to sea management approach through peer to peer learning, building commitment, and so on. So, with that, uh, um, I, I will end my conclusions. I hope that I've managed to summarize and perhaps add a little bit to what panelists said. Uh, so, Sarah Antoya, it's back to you, and thank you so much for the collaboration on this event. Thank you very much, uh, Jürgen, for these excellent key messages and also for highlighting the importance of science, important, the importance of partnerships. And we, all the organizers, are the members of the source to sea uh, uh, platform. And uh, I have the pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Abu Amani, Director of Division of Water Sciences at UNESCO, my colleague. And Abu, you have heard that science has been repeatedly and repeatedly highlighted. And so it is natural to you, please, um, your floor is yours to conclude this event, highlighting the importance of science as well as the water security as it was, it was mentioned by my, uh, our co-organizer, Yerker. Thank you, thank you very much, Sarantuya. And uh, I don't know if I can do better than uh, Jaker, who really summarized it all, but let me put other layers um, uh, based on the discussions. We all um, agree on the critical importance of science. But uh, I want to add some layers on that. I believe that we need 
inclusive decision making. What do, what do you mean? Inclusive decision making means that throughout the process of taking the decision, based of course on science, we need to bring on board all the, t the key stakeholders in the decision making, not only at the end of the process, they have to be at the beginning of the process. So inclusiveness, this is a keyword we need to keep in mind. The other element I want to add, still on science, is the open science. I don't know if you have been following what's going on uh, during those two, two weeks at UNESCO, the general conference at UNESCO. This week approved the recommendation of on open science. And open science means that science should be accessible to all. That's, that's, that's very, very important. I really encourage you to Google that recommendation providing a normative framework to UNESCO's member state on moving forward with the open science. And also open science means also citizen science. If you, if you go through the document, you will see citizen science play a key role. Also, the science is not only our modern science. It's also include local and indigenous knowledge. So when we think about science, let's open it up. The knowledge framework, all the knowledge available, helping to take appropriate decision we need to have it because we are facing a complex problem. All the interaction, so we need that science for evidence. I want also to put another layer, which I didn't hear properly, is on the education. We need to have a complete change of behavior at all level. Because what we have witnessing is sometimes the issue of education. So we need to educate people all across on their, the consequence of their acts vis-a-vis -vis the pollution within the land, which is going throughout the um, source and sea continuum to the ocean. So this is another element I believe we should also emphasize uh, uh, on it, the education part. Now, the last part concerns what we have been doing at UNESCO. As you know, at UNESCO, we're hosting two important intergovernmental programs, one on freshwater, the intergovernmental hydrological program, which just uh, prepared its strategic plan for 2022-2029. The good news of that is that source to sea approach will be discuss and will, will is integrated within the strategy. So we'll be continuing working with you on source to see through the IHP9 strategy. In parallel also, as you know, we have also the Intergovernmental Oceanic Commission, which is in charge of the ocean decade. And that synergy with the other sectors is giving us really an opportunity to mobilize the two scientific communities together so that we can move forward in a holistic way the issue of uh, pollution within the ocean. My last point is on the synergy of the different decades. I think Jekyll has already highlighted that, but I want to emphasize again. The two decades first related to water, so the ocean, and the water action decade, and then the restoration decade. Those three decades are going hand in hand. If really we want to have meaningful impact through the, out the next coming years, we need to find a way to bridge synergies among those three decades. So this is really my, my last message. And once again, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. From UNESCO side, we are really great. Uh, we are ready to continue working with you. As I said, source to sea approach has been integrated within IHP strategic plan. And we are looking forward to continue working with you on this area. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Abu. Um, thank you. Uh, this um, concludes our session today, and I would like to thank, on behalf of all our co conveners, the Stockholm uh, Water Institutes, Horse to Sea Platform, Global Water Partnership, Ramsar Convention, all our conveners uh, for this um, uh, excellent session. And also, most importantly, I would like to thank you all, all participants, for your attendance and for your participation in this session. Your interest on this topic shows that you are already interested and committed to take, ac take action on this important challenge. And I hope that we hope that this session has um, convinced you to commit even further to take concrete action. And also, as Abu highlighted, it also served to raise your awareness. Please share this knowledge with your colleagues, with your partners, and uh, look forward to collaborating with you all. Thank you very much. <laughs>